Good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to the public lecture, which will be given by uh, Professor Albert Klassen, our dear guest uh, and university distinguished professor in the Department of German Studies at the University of Arizona, Tucson. Uh, we are very happy to have you with us. Uh, I extend my greetings to the audience uh, who follows, uh, who is following us uh, on YouTube. Uh, my name is Jakub Kujawinski, and I will have pleasure to chair this event today. Without further ado, I invite Professor Krzysztof Matusik, uh, Deputy Dean of the Faculty of uh, History, uh, to take the floor. Sehr geehrter Herr Professor Klassen, liebe Damen und Herren, Das ist für mich eine besondere Ehre, Sie, Professor Klassen, im Namen des Dekans der, der Historischen Fakultät der adam universität in Poznan, Professor Josef Dobosch und unsere ganze Fakultätsgemeinschaft herzlich begrüßen. Sie kennen, Herr Professor Klassen, unsere Universität sehr, sehr gut, haben sehr lange, äh, langsdauernde äh, wissenschaftliche Kontakte mit unseren Ko Kollegen. Äh, das ist kein Erstaunen. Wir haben eine gute, schöne, alte, äh, mittelartige, medievistische Tradition in Poznan. Äh, unter den Gründer Uni unserer Universität im Jahr 1919 finden wir da einer der Väter der polnischen Medivistik in der 20. Jahrhundert und zwar Professor Kazimierz Tymieniecki. Wir sollen auch solche großen Meister der Medivistik, die mit Poznan verbunden waren, wie Henry Gowmiański, wie Gerard Lawuda, wie Brigida Kirbis, wie Jerzy Strzelczyk nennen. Was möchte ich auch betonen, dass äh, diese große Meister äh, auch in der schweren Zeit der, äh, des Eisernen äh, Vorhang die internationalen, internationalen Kontakte äh, gepflegt haben, äh, was nach der äh, Wende äh, noch intensiver, äh, intensiver wird. Äh, der Covid-Krise hat nur die Form der Kontakte geändert, nicht oder Vorteile. Wir sind aber sehr zufrieden, sehr glücklich, dass wir zu, zu, zu die äh, alte, traditionelle Form Kontakte face-to-face -face zurückkommen und dass Sie gerade äh, Zeit gefunden haben, um nach Bosnien zu kommen und äh, mit uns ähm, äh, die er Ergebnisse Ihrer äh, Forschung, Ihrer äh, Reflexion äh, zu teilen. Äh, lieber Herr Professor Klassen, äh, alles Gute, schönen Aufenthalt in Bosnien, ein viel erfolgreiches Aufenthalt in Bosnien. Dankeschön. I will still a few more minutes uh, to briefly introduce, it is a hard task to say uh, important two words about our, our distinguished guests, but since uh, we are followed also by non-historians or people less uh, uh, less um, familiar with medieval studies, perhaps uh, a short introduction uh, is, uh, is helpful. Uh, Albert Klassen is distinguished by extremely vast uh, uh, range of scholarly interests, which cover the vast field of uh, German and European literature, both medieval and early modern, uh, as well as cultural history another broad concept. Uh, his more than 100 published scholarly books make him one of the most prolific medieval scholars. Uh, the topics addressed uh, in the books, uh, uh, articles, chapters uh, published by Albert Klassen in books edited or co-edited by him uh, place him at the cutting edge of medieval studies. Uh, communication, women's literature, sexual life, leisure, childhood, aging, uh, magic uh, are only a selection of, uh, of wide range of topics uh, which are explored in the publications of uh, Albert Klassen. Uh, I can add religious toleration or crime and punishment, uh, two topics uh, shown by uh, two books, uh, the, uh, not the heaviest one that I found in our stocks in, in the library. That's why I chose I chose uh, them. Uh, if I if I am allowed to to add a remark, Prodomo Nostra, we were very happy last year uh, to see Albert Klassen among the contributors of a book of collected essays uh, that uh, the Faculty of History 
prepared for, uh, for uh, Albert Klassen uh, friend, Jerzy Strzelczyk, professor, retired professor of uh, our university, and a chapter dedicating to agency, female agency, as illustrated in selected vernacular text, is in this book. Uh, not only is Albert Klassen uh, protagonist of medieval studies, uh, but also a commentator and manager of current scholarship. As the editor of two journals, Medievistique and um, Humanities Open Access Online, uh, as author or editor or co-editor of many textbooks or companions, just to mention one, the textbook of uh, medieval studies published in 2010, too heavy to bring it today, and to free volume um, publication, and not least as a tireless reviewer. Uh, in today's lecture, Albert Klassen will address another uh, topic, another subject which is under debate in the current medieval scholarship, globalism before globalism in pre-modern age. Over to you. Thank you so much for the wonderful, kind introduction and the welcome. Vielen, vielen herzlichen Dank. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to talk to all of you. Um, and I'm very excited that I can be here in Poznan. This is actually quite a bit of a tradition. I think it's at least my third, maybe even the fourth visit. So in a way, I'm trying to practice what I'm preaching. I mean, when you talk about globalism, then you should try to be a little bit global. And so for me, the connection between Tucson and uh, Poznan is a very valuable one, and I really appreciate also the interdisciplinary approach. That is one of my key interests. I come from the discipline of medieval German studies. I've expanded vastly to European medieval literature and then vastly to European, uh, at least Western, and now more or less other cultures to, to uh, so cultural history. And um, so, I try always to, every year to bring together scholars from all over the world. And one of the greatest advantages, really, I have to say, of COVID has been, COVID-19 for me has been that I've been able to attract scholars really virtually from all over the world. And we have had a conference like this one. This was a conference in, in end of April. And I've uh, then people from Mali, Algeria, Egypt, Israel, Czech Republic, uh, Japan, and so forth. This suddenly becomes possible. However, on a personal note, I much more prefer to be here in person. And it's a very different situation. And I think we all can engage with each other in a much different way. Uh, I just uh, finished uh, the big Kalamazoo conference. It was all online. It's OK, yes. It has certain advantages, but we're really missing out something. I think we all learn a lot from each other, uh, even if we uh, have different opinions. But just our conversation, I learned quite a bit right there, uh, different perspectives. And I had questions for him. I think that's what scholarship really is all about. So I really appreciate the fact that it's Friday afternoon, it's hot, it's end of the week, and so many people are here. So I really feel very honored to see so many of you. Uh, and my greatest concern is always that I don't simply present my findings or my, my concepts, but rather that we can engage in a conversation as much as possible. Um, so can you give me a timeline roughly so that I, because I want to have, really have a question and answer. Yeah, very good. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Yeah, great. So once again, this is a great opportunity for me. And um, this is for me actually a unique situation because I'm right now in the midst of writing or finishing already the introduction to the new book. So based on the conference we had, very, very interdisciplinary from people in the history of medicine to people in modern Arabic, not modern, medieval Arabic literature to Western literature to historians and so forth. So this book will right now uh, be an address to the most latest most pressing and most difficult challenges. When I talk about globalism before globalism, then I really address ultimately a concern that affects colleagues all over the world. So for example, in Brazil, the, in Brazil 
there is a journal, uh, Esmosos, which deals exactly with this question of global history. So there is, in a way, there is a, an uprise in many parts of this world against the westernization, the Eurocentrism, uh, and the desire to bring things together. Whether this is all possible is a big question. And what I will be able to present to you is, to some extent, the controversies that affect all our field. Many, many different perspectives have been raised. There are lots of different schools of thought. There's a lot of different materials brought to the table. And I try to f forge my own path toward the goal of addressing and making this possible. You can see already from the title that I belong to the one school that believes that globalism actually was in place long before modern globalism. Uh, it would behoove me maybe to define globalism, uh, but it, that's sort of a very generic thing. Normally people talk about globalism in the context of the 20th or 21st century with the connections, economic connections uh, everywhere. Um, but the claim here, and I'm trying to promote this further, is of course we have many different examples of global connections and the key word might be networking. So to what extent was it possible for people in the past to network? And I would like to introduce lots of different materials and we can see how that fits into our general discussion. Some of that will be historical, some of that will be art historical, some of that will be purely historical, travels, uh, mapemunde and so forth. And I've chosen as a background for my presentation a wonderful scene from somewhere, probably the Rocky Mountains, simply to give us sort of a little bit of sense of, of the global. My own world looks very, very different. Where I live, that is really a semi-arid desert. Um, but um, I'm very happy that I can bring from the semi-arid desert some, maybe some new thoughts to your wonderful world here in Western uh, Poland. I'm very happy to be here. So, all right, let's start with this. A few theoretical reflections. That is the uh, most uh, difficult and most hotly uh, disputed area. Uh, lots of scholars are debating even the possibilities uh, and whether we can even talk about uh, globalism as such. Um, I have here two major names that I need to bring to the discussion, namely whether globalism already existed in the modern world. Uh, one of the strongest ones is Geraldine Hing, who teaches at the University of uh, Austin, Texas, has written several major books and argues in strong terms that um, globalism already existed. And of course, we could maybe or should differentiate between these two words, globalization versus globalism. And I think globalism means more the uh, general situation of existing networks, whereas globalization carries over more sort of the meaning of colonialism or um, uh, empire building. So these are two different things. Immanuel Wallerstein is a more theoretical thinker about globalism, but he does not work too much with medieval concepts. You find tons of studies on globalism in modern uh, economic and historical context. That does not concern me so much. Um, so the general question we all have to raise then is what kind of connections might even have been possible? Uh, to what extent were people able to travel? What interest did they have? What did they know? What linguistic <laughs> abilities existed? Uh, and then who would really have been involved in this uh, global context? I will be able to deviate from my PowerPoint all, all the time, and I will just do this here. One very quick example is the marriage of a Byzantine princess in the 10th century with, um, uh, I think it was Otto II, so uh, up there in Magdeburg. So suddenly you have a little island of Greek culture up there in northern Germany. That is wild. Uh, how was that possible? And at the same time, uh, Arab embassy came from Cordoba 
to visit the emperor in Magdeburg. And they reported, for example, about a martyr who had died in Cordoba in the 10th century, namely Pelagius, and then a Latin writing poet there in Bad Gandersheim, namely Roswitha of Gandersheim, wrote a, a religious play on that martyr in Cordoba. So you have a triangular relationship between Andalusia, Byzantium, and northern Germany. If that is not an early form of, of globalism, then I don't know what it is. Okay? Uh, of course, we are facing a theoretical problem. We all probably come from a more Western perspective. I'm also limited. I don't know enough about China, Japan, India, the Philippines. I will be able to go into some of those aspects, but I always have a little bit the bias of Western perspective. I'm limited in this. But Already you can see how far easily we can expand on that and rebel against anyone who might uh, argue against this. I'm looking at all kinds of different uh, subject matters and we need the help of lots of different scholars and different disciplines in order to promote this subject matter. Um, if you just talk about uh, commerce, trade, uh, you have always traders, merchants traveling all over the world and already in the 10th and 11th centuries you hear of a lot of European travelers, a lot of Jewish merchants for example, but also the other way around. So th that would be a topic I have to look much more into it. In context would be the Silk Road, uh, lots of Chinese products coming to the Black Sea area from the Black Sea then to the Adriatic Sea and from the than to Northern Europe. So there are very many different branches that we can look at. Art, that is one of the latest uh, topic, art history, where we're still struggling quite a lot. Um, one of my contributors uh, was looking at the influence of Arabic architecture uh, in Christian architecture, particularly in Italy, but she was not yet fully informed yet. So she's in Italy right now and working on this. Another scholar at my conference looked at medicine, a very critical and very interesting topic to what extent medical or, uh, products or drugs or even perfumes made their way from, let's say, the Arabic or then further Persian and maybe in Indian world. Then I also we could look or need to look into science, philosophy, uh, and literature. Uh, our literature is one of actually the best indicators to observe the transmission of culture. So globalism has a lot to do with transfer, translation, transmission. And um, just to give you, I probably will come back later, I forget, one of the most interesting and most prolific examples for globalism is a text called Balaam and Josephet. This is a text that basically tells the story of Gaudama Buddha, originally written in the first or second century in India, which made then its way in endless variations, first in Persian, then Aramaic, then Greek, then Hebrew, then Arabic, then Latin, then French, German, English, you name it. And so the story of Baudama Buddha, Buddha was known throughout all of medieval Europe and there are also artworks in various parts of Austria or Romania depicting this text. So just the incredible march from maybe second century India to the rest of Europe throughout the entire Middle Ages, just on the basis of this one text. To what extent the readers or listeners, the audiences, might have been aware of the original source, that's a totally different question. But we can trace today an incredible network of translations that went from east to west. To what extent west to east, that's another issue. So, all right. Um, we are, of course, also very much limited in this regard when we talk about the participants, the so-called brokers, um, who were involved in developing networks. We're always talking about a sliver, of course, you know, the small groups of intellectuals, people of a particular education, and um, not certainly the masses. But that's a very common thing. That's what we all have left. We have the sources, so individuals who contributed to the uh, connections. Um, one interesting thing is um, it was developed by a colleague, Ronald Poe Chia Sia, 
uh, he has a wonderful article on maps uh, in my volume, Paradigm Shifts, and he looks at um, late medieval, early modern Chinese maps and discovered that in the 14th, rather 15th century, China, as we, when we look at the maps, for example, uh, moved basically to a form of Asia centrism because they were increasingly challenged by the Mongols and just studying the history of Chinese maps, uh, we can observe that increasingly even the Arab lands disappeared, not to even speak about Europe. Europe was irrelevant for the Chinese. It was not really a sophisticated country. Even the Mongols thought there was just an appendix. They didn't need very much. So um, by the late 15th century, Europe basically disappears from the Asian Chinese uh, world map, basically, or mental map. But before, certainly, there are many, many more indications of uh, at least curiosity and interest. Um, I just need to refer to that because it suddenly shows you the complexity of the matter. I'm not into uh, Chinese maps. I don't know enough about it, but these are um, indications that help me to build a larger map of globalism and information that comes from many different directions. Uh, a little bit about latest research, um, just I list a couple of uh, studies. Uh, without going into the details, I just want to confirm how much this topic is really exciting researchers all over the world. Um, many of those published in English, uh, but you can see here, for example, this interesting new term, Eurafrasia chronologies, uh, that reflects very much the latest uh, concern to what extent, for example, medieval Africa was in connection with medieval Europe. And we have a number of new studies that talk about the trade between the Kingdom of Mali, for example, across the Sahara to the northern uh, uh, shore, the southern shore of the Mediterranean. And um, we have a number of very recent studies that really try to bring African history into the fold of Europe. European history, and there are indeed many more connections that we need to explore in the future. Um, this is also by Bearcroft uh, in the ecology of world literature from antiquity to the present day. That is um, hmm, something that I find almost ironic. There are a lot of attempts by both historians who talk about global world history and literary scholars who create, in my opinion, nothing but a patchwork. Patchwork meaning they just put together pieces here and there and they don't form a really cohesive whole. So suddenly, let's say, they have a chapter on Chinese history, then a chapter on Persian history, then a chapter on maybe Greek history, and then they jump to maybe uh, the Congo, and then to Peru, and it's all fine and means nothing. In my opinion, that is a very dangerous, very slippery road because this is a patchwork. I have nothing to do as a Western and historian with maybe Mongolian history. So there need to be connections. And I think, uh, particularly in, um, in, in the field of world literature, that's even worse. I and mean, they throw in a lot of different texts, and no one knows these texts. The context is then missing. And I think it really does a major disservice to, uh, to research and to our students. Uh, this is the practice of global history, European perspectives. Um, I don't go into the details. Another major volume edited by Matthias uh, Matthias Medell in 2019. Uh, then here by our famous uh, colleague in Berlin, uh, Michael Michael Borgolte, Europa im Geflecht der Welt: Mittelalterliche Migrationen in globalen Bezügen. That is an interesting aspect because he integrates the term migration. And I think in terms of migration, that means movement of people, you find probably much more evidence supporting a whole notion of globalism before modern, uh, maybe before modern migrations. You have much more uh, flux of population than we might think. In one of my recent uh, monographs, I worked out on a book on freedom uh, imprisonment and slavery, 
and then had a follow-up volume also dealing with incarceration. But the topic of slavery, for example, is extremely interesting in so far as uh, we have slaves from all over the world, really, uh, let's say, merging in the Mediterranean, but also farther uh, uh, west. Archaeologists, are very important contributors to our field, have, for example, found very recently, maybe three years ago uh, or four years ago, uh, that um, a major cemetery in uh, London from about 1348, 1350, and following the Black Death, consisted of, according to DNA samples, of about 26% of the entire population buried there in the cemetery of non-European origins. What the heck does that mean? 26% of the people buried there in London were maybe black. And we don't know anything about them. Only now we find sort of their traces. That is amazing. Now, no one wanted to talk about their slaves, but the DNA is there. So that is really, very really interesting. And I have many more uh, points uh, to mention. Um, other globes, past and peripheral imaginations of globalization. I need to mention something in that context. Geraldine Hang and others arguing vehemently and strongly against the clash between, these are the two words, core and periphery. So they argue that it is not fair and not right to divvy up world history into cores or central uh, places of culture or whatever it might be, or science, and then the periphery. And they insist that we really need to equalize the world. That's a very strong argument, but at the same time, I have problems with that, because if you equalize everything, and then you might say the history of the Amazon Indians in the 11th century is just as important as the situation of 12th century Paris Sorbonne University. Sorry, these are totally two different things. And I don't, personally don't care about hegemonization. Why not? Those in the uh, hegemony are simply those who produce texts, who create artwork, establish networks. And those people are interesting, for me at least. So if we have to leave some people in the dust, let's say ordinary rural population, fine. Nothing against them. They are all equal as human beings. But when I look at networking, then I need to look at people who were the makers and shakers. And I cannot be content simply with saying all people are equal and they all belong to the same global family. Yes, yeah, so what? That leaves me with nothing. So I want to differentiate and qualify a little bit further. Um, this is another study. So, in a way, it's almost endless to the point that we have so many different publications and they're all struggling very much to come to terms with this here, a companion to the global early Middle Ages. Uh, a very interesting subject matter. Um, uh, here, the edited volume, Islamic and European Expansion, the Forging of a Global Order. So, trying, this is a little bit older, 1993, but trying to inject more the Islamic perspective. And that is, of course, here a huge problem I face myself and probably everyone here in the room, or maybe not all, but I don't know, and I cannot read Arabic. So there's a huge block for me, and I don't read Chinese and so forth. There's so many different languages. I don't, need, uh, I don't read Persian and so forth and so forth. And I, I feel very strongly that I ought to know but I cannot. So, that, in other words, we need collaboration. So, the more we can ask and colleagues who speak those languages and can read those texts, the better for our general notion. But, of course, the relationship between the Islamic world and the European world was of extreme importance. But as soon as you move into the Islamic world, you suddenly notice that their focus was really very different. They didn't care that much about Europe. They cared about uh, the Saudi Arabic uh, Peninsula, Persia, and then further east, Malaysia and uh, Philippines. So, the focus is sometimes very, very different, but you can learn quite a lot. Uh, this was a very interesting volume by Klaus Oshema from 
von Bochum und anderes. Abrahams Erbe, Konkurrenz, Konflikt und Koexistenz der Religionen im europäischen Mittelalter. Still a very Western perspective, but the clash of the religions and the exchange amongst the various um, uh, representatives uh, in that volume that you listed there. This is one of the most interesting topics Uh, I cannot go too much into that, it would sidetrack me a lot, but the whole question to what extent during the Middle Ages did people engage with representatives of other religions? And maybe the, one of the interesting topics would be, and I can go into details if you wish, the translation of the Quran. It's a very, very interesting topic, and I can tell you quite a lot, I know quite a lot about the translations and the conflicts with all of that. But um, an indication how much Uh, globalism requires a lot of language knowledge. And there's always a question, who has that? Anyway, um, then, I mean, I will go on a little bit more because I have just too many uh, topics and too many uh, efforts. But I see always sort of the same trend. It is very fashionable to use the catch word global, and then you just write whatever just comes to your mind. Uh, very global, it means at the end, nothing. So it's always the challenge. And I, as a philologist and an historian, cultural historian, if I may call myself like that, is always go back to the sources. And don't tell me these big, or give me these big pictures. I need evidence. I need really solid uh, source uh, studies. And so that's a problem a little bit with all these different um, studies that I list here. This is more a modern study for modern globalization. I don't need this. But this is uh, one of the major studies. Very thin book, maybe 100 pages or so. But she summarizes very nicely uh, the controversy uh, and pre presents a lot of the major arguments. So. <laughs> I'm a little bit negative uh, as well because I'm afraid that because of the war in the Ukraine, we might suddenly face the end of globalism, even in the modern world. Uh, who knows what is happening because the Western industries, as you know, is withdrawing from Russia left and right. Even China, as the Chinese market is in, in danger. So is maybe the West retreating from globalism? I don't know, the future will tell. Uh, so it might be ironic, the end of globalism just in the global age. So it behooves us to look more maybe what happened before. Um, and so then the problem might, of course, be, but I think I can uh, uh, ease those problems, uh, is the danger, are we not maybe anachronistic? Could it be that we are talking about an, uh, globalism simply because we are living in a global world and try to find uh, sort of analogies or similar points in the past. So that's a simple question I have always to keep in mind. Uh, but I think uh, we have also a lot of different meanings of uh, globalism. In other words, what do I mean by that? I, am I talking about economic connections? Am I talking about military con conflicts or collaboration? And I mentioned already a couple of examples of literary, artistic, or political connections. The entire world of diplomacy, for example, is very, very interesting. Where did the diplomats go? We know that <laughs> a simple example, Harun al-Rashid sends Uh, what was his name? Ab Abbas the Elephant in 806 to Aachen. How many thousand miles are this? I don't know. This poor animal had to walk for six years uh, all the way along the North African coast and then by ship across to Marseille or somewhere and then all the way north. Lived only six years after that. But The diplomatic connection, that is interesting that Harun al-Rashid had heard about Charlemagne and wanted to make sure that uh, kings or sultan uh, exchange things. That is an interesting uh, point that we need always to keep in mind. Uh, I th uh, maybe the diplomats, they exist already at that time, just did not leave enough sources or we have not paid enough attention to their accounts. And. Um, Let's use just one example, musicians. We know that throughout the entire Middle Ages, musicians were always on the go. 
And we know that musicians constantly looked for new types of melodies. Um, sometimes exotic melodies, sometimes exotic instruments. A uh, very famous example would be Tristan in the Tristan and Isolde story, who as a young man reaches then the court of King uh, Mark in Cornwall, where he demonstrates to be the master musician, but he dismisses all these music instruments and says, ah, that's nothing, I can do this with my left hand. But my real instrument is, and he mentions one, which no one ever has heard of. And then he proves to be the absolute uh, master musicians. So musicians got around. We don't know often enough about them, but one of the big questions, which I just like to throw out without having really much of evidence, is the question to what extent the entire discourse on love emerged in medieval Europe in the early um, 12th century, and the huge debate whether maybe Arabic music might have influence. I have my doubts about it, but in particular because the music is very different, the, the melodies are very different, but that's something we have certainly to keep in mind. So I just skip this a little bit. Um, and ultimately, uh, I like to frame this uh, all into the history of, of the history of mentality. We have done this so far mostly in a European context, but uh, let's say um, Jacques Le Goff is a great name, Peter Dinzelbacher, a very, very famous name. Uh, I think that is one of the most exciting uh, approaches to history, understanding the mentality, histoire de mentalité. That's the school uh, Les Annales. And so I think that would, the globalism would add really an interesting uh, angle or aspect to the history of mentality, uh, maybe because of difference or maybe because of similarities. We'll see. Um, Joseph Nier has already tried to uh, extricate these two terms, globalism versus globalization. Um, and he defines it as such, globalism at its core seeks to describe and explain nothing more than a world which is characterized by networks of connections that span multi-continental distances. Great, nice definition. Whether this was already in place in the Middle Ages, that's an interesting question. And I kind of, as we say in German, wie die Katze um den heißen Brei. So I'm going around with really addressing it, and ultimately I will, I will try to get closer. Um, so he also says globalization refers to the increase or decline in the degree of globalism. It focuses on the forces, the dynamisms, or speed of these changes. This is more or less driven by modern concepts. So uh, the latest studies, you know, it keeps going. It's just incredible. Catherine Holmes, Global Middle Ages, the East. Um, so looking more at uh, Chinese history or so. They just appeared very recently. Uh, and I have the problem, that's the search for global, single global narrative, as if they all could talk the same language. That was certainly not the case. I think if at all, and I, I think it is valuable, we have to distinguish further um, meetings of different narratives that intersected. Okay, let me repeat that, that's very important. So I do not think that we have a global narrative. I don't believe that that's even faintly correct. But what we do probably can find, and that's what I'm interested in, is the interconnection of various narratives that meet and exchange, lock into each other and separate once again. And that is constantly in flux. I think that's a more concrete approach to that. We can always determine economic contexts. That is maybe so self-evident that I don't need to go much further into the details, but money has always ruled the entire world history, and the interest in exotic products uh, coming from the East has always been of a major, major factor. Um, and archaeologists have proven already many times uh, through funeral gifts uh, how much, let's say, Asian products made their way uh, into Swedish um, graves and so forth. So that interest can be traced everywhere. Uh, one of the latest uh, interesting 
subject matters, which confirms this further. Again, it's not at all my field, but you can see how much the interdisciplinary approach allows me to do this. It's the object of the Gehr Falcon. The Gehr Falcon, G-Y-R Falcon, is a very fast bird of prey. And in Mamluk, Egypt, and other parts, they enjoyed the Gehr Falcon very much during the 12th, 13th centuries, and normally imported that bird from the northeastern Asia, uh, maybe Mongolia. Latest research uh, in falconry, however, has discovered that by the 13th century, the import of Gehr Falcons from Iceland to Egypt can be confirmed. And it's absolutely unbelievable that these traders brought the very valuable Gehr Falcons to Egypt. That is amazing. That's connection. That is where the economic interest suddenly can bridge and span huge differences. That's not a narrative, but it's, they could talk. They could uh, barter the price and whatever it might be. It sounds silly, a girl falcon. I mean, it's, but race up there, Scandinavia, northern Scandinavia, and making its way suddenly to uh, Egypt or uh, uh, neighboring countries. So, and another a very important term, and I've mentioned it already once before, and I bring it back here to the table, uh, the term, at least that's used in American English um, jargon, the broker. So normally it comes from the stocks, stock markets, but the brokers are those who negotiate and build bridges, particularly in the eastern Mediterranean. And I need to expand immediately the Black Sea. The Black Sea and the eastern Mediterranean were zones of contacts with many different cultures coming together, Greek, Jewish, uh, Mongols, if you will, Genoa, Venice, uh, African cultures, Ethiopia, uh, Persia. So the, the brokers in those areas were those who spoke lots of different languages, had the resources um, and to trade, to communicate, uh, to exchange, and um, so building networks. So I think the term broker is a really useful one because these are not the masses, but individuals who can work uh, in particular, to establish the networks. And that's probably the same case as today. <laughs> I regard myself a little bit as a broker <laughs> because I'm here and you allow me to do a little bit global work. You know, that's very nice, I think. So, and or networking, that's also very of a key, a key term to what extent people can exchange information and build. Um, well, connections, that means letters. So this is a major subject matter in historical research, right? Letters. Who wrote letters? What letter collections do we have? From where did those letters come in? And so forth. Another very nice topic would be related to that marriage. How many princesses um, married from one country to a completely different one? I don't know enough about the Asian or Arabic world, but I have very good examples, let's say, Anne of Bohemia marrying, I forget the name, the king, whatever, British king Richard II, maybe? I'm not quite sure. But she moved her entire household, including her Bibles and her Czech texts, uh, liturgical texts, and the whole household from Prague to London. That's brokerage. And lots of women went through this experience. But in the 15th century, I you know a number of other princesses from northern Scotland, for example, uh, the later Anne of uh, Austria, uh, or the French princess, Elizabeth marrying the Count of Nassau, and then suddenly a cultural contacts take place. To what extent this also can be extended further east, uh, east, I don't know, but it's very, very likely, let's say, the Arabic princesses married here and there. A beautiful literary example is uh, Boccaccio. Boccaccio in his Decameron. Um, it's day two, story seven, 
where the um, sultan's daughter, Alatil, is uh, supposed to marry the king of the Algarve. That's somewhere in Morocco. It's just a literary projection. Uh, and the ship makes its way almost all across the Mediterranean, then shipwreck, and she, only the Alatil survives. And she speaks only Arabic. Then she is rescued. And then, well, rescued by a nobleman, a knight, who then sleeps with her. And because she's so attractive, then this knight is murdered. She's abducted. And then she goes from one man to another man. Ultimately, she sleeps with eight men and leaves behind uh, lots of dead bodies. Because everyone is jealous and everyone wants to sleep with her. So she makes the whole way Eastern Mediterranean, Western Mediterranean, back to the Eastern Mediterranean, and then can come home again and pretend still to be a virgin. <laughs> Miracle. And, <laughs> and then finally, uh, her future husband, the Arabic king of the Algarve, sends troops and they bring her back safely to the Western world. So, just as a literary projection, I know this is not historical fact, that's fiction, but fiction serves us really well as a platform for imaginations. What did they conceive as possible? So that's what I mean, fantasy and reality. These two components have to come together. Uh, and, but we have here this beautiful example, Marco Polo. We know exactly that he traveled and the lack of, of success he had with his travels was really because it was boring. He talked about reality. So, for example, uh, he refers to uh, the salamander, and medieval imagination was that salamanders live in fire. And he says, no, he, I'm now using the modern word, no, this is asbestos. Asbestos doesn't burn. He refers to the unicorn, and he says, no, that's a rhinoceros. So that's the reason why the, his travels were kind of boring, because he talked so much about the reality, the facts. John Mandeville, ah, Mandeville, he goes into all these fantasies and all the monsters, that's great. And that's exactly what people liked. Very successful. Mandeville was the bestseller of his time. And he presents the entire world to the East, uh, Philippines, Japan, and so forth, but always monsters. So an interesting contrast, a uh, concrete traveler, and then the armchair traveler. Uh, others were very, very interesting, and I should have switched this around. Already in the fourth century, we have, I think, a French woman, Egeria, who travels by herself to the Holy Land. And if that was possible for a woman in the fourth century, then you can imagine how many other women probably traveled as well. Uh, one of the most daring ones, she doesn't quite fit into the notion of globalism, but Marjorie Kemp, that's early 15th century, she travels by herself without any money or any language knowledge, first to Rome, to Jerusalem, then to Santiago de Compostela, then later to Norway, and ends up here in Poland, in Gdańsk. And then slowly made her way back to England. So if a woman can do that, what did other people do? Such as Felix Fabri, a major Dominican, who writes a beautiful, wonderful, extensive uh, travel uh, log, Evagatorium, in which he gives us so many really concrete details. And um, he deserves really full attention because he's the only one I've ever found who describes in very graphic terms, what is happening on the ship and when they have to use the bathroom and the big storm comes in. And he is talking about the shitty situation. Uh, it's amazing. He goes really into the details and the cramped quarters and so forth. And if he is so interested in the real concrete situation, you know, the daily life, and then how he then meets um, people who help him to rent uh, asses or donkeys, and how he then, on his second trip, 1483 or so, uh, then brings a gift with him for his previous guide, because he remembered him. And then from there, he goes all over the, the Holy Land. So there are many different possibilities. Just two extreme points, Egeria and Felix Fabri. 
And also, by the way, Felix Fabry was, um, I'm not sure whether you're aware about it, he also wrote um, Sion's Pilgrims, meaning he wrote the same pilgrimage account for women, for cloistered women who, however, could not travel. So he says, ah, oh, so much better. That's Zoom. You zoom in to whatever, the holy site, and here you pray. You don't have to ask for the key. You don't have to pay for the entrance fee. You just read it, and you are doing just fine. So <laughs> it's kind of fun to see the, both the reality and fantasy. Well, not fantasy, but uh, the possibility to imagine the entire trip to the uh, Eastern world. Um, you're working on maps. I refer to Mape Mundi. Uh, we have a huge amount of maps. Of course, none of them were really concrete, or none of them were really, really served uh, to, as a basis for travel. It would be absurd. I mean, we talked about the, um, the Epstorf map, which was as big, maybe, or is as big as the entire wall. You wouldn't take such a huge map to travel. No, this was for, uh, for maybe instruction, for uh, religious uh, instructions, or whatever. Uh, I refer to Karen Pinto, who is one of the greatest experts on Arabic uh, maps. So again, this is the collaboration I'm looking for, where then scholars in different disciplines or with different materials can contribute to create more connecting points so that we can slowly build this map that I'm trying to uh, refer to. The, I discussed this already, so global trade. I can uh, skip this now. Uh, and this is the reference. So in case you want to read more about it, it you know, it just appeared last year. So as you said, you know, cutting edge, uh, I try to be there. So because I review so many books, I know always what's going on. You know, it has a certain advantage, uh, but it's a really fantastic study. So um, let's look at some of the very well-known global players. I would like to introduce them in very concrete terms. I would like to argue that if at all we can talk about globalism, networking, connectivity, then we just need to look at people who manage to do that. So I start with the Huns, of course. Uh, you have in the early Middle Ages massive migrations or military operations. Uh, if you will, think about the Germanic uh, migration, which was a massive movement of people, maybe always the vanguards, but whether you think about the, uh, the Vandals, the uh, Ostrogoths, Visigoths, you name them all. But the Huns really as uh, some of the major movers and shakers who made all their way all, uh, all the way to, to the West. Uh, and I would call them really in their mobility, which is another key term for our discussion, their mobility uh, as significant contributors. If at all, then let's look at the Huns. I like to think about the Arabs as global players. Uh, look at the, this wonderful map, um, how far they got. But, you know, Europe was just on the sideline for them. Yes, they made their way to Andalus, a little bit to, to the Provence, but then they were defeated. And so their focus was really much more what we call today uh, Iran, Iraq, and then up, up there Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, maybe into Pakistan uh, and Afghanistan. So that's, in a way, certainly a global player. And if you look at the waterways, you suddenly understand also why they mattered so much, because the Arabs entertain a lot of connections, of course, with China. So through trade, uh, that's a lot of things that I don't know enough, um, but it's certainly the fact that the Chinese, uh, early Chinese had, as I mentioned at the beginning, they had the Arabic world so very much in the viewpoint and only later lost that because of the Mongol thread. So they were uh, refocusing away. So the, you could say the Arabs as intermediary players. And then I really like to talk about the Vikings um, who are in many different ways global players. Uh, let's take a look at the maps. Um, I have here Finland or Newfoundland. Uh, just the very latest uh, archaeological research has confirmed that they settled there in, in 1016. Uh, didn't stay too long, but you can see the enormous outreach, Iceland, Greenland, Finland. 
And when you then read some of the Icelandic sagas from the 13th, 14th centuries, you regularly hear of uh, very strange global aspects because many times when a hero has done some murder or is in, has a military political conflict, he is uh, exiled. That was the common practice amongst the Icelanders. And what they commonly did, you can see here the dates, the battles down there, they joined the Byzantine army. The Icelanders formed their own military unit. And it's amazing. Icelanders serving as a battalion for the Byzantine emperor. It's, it's wild, right? That's, that's uh, uh, so unexpected. But when you read this, and then you say, well, well, I was exiled, so my yeah, just he went to, the, to Europe and then went down to Constantinople, yeah, and joined the forces, and that was it. And then they don't go into any further elements. What does it tell us? It tells us that the globalism existed, but they didn't really regard it as such an exceptional thing. Maybe we are victims of uh, misconceptions. We think so much globalism is the only phenomenon of the 21st century. When it is, of course, long, long before us, of course in the Middle Ages, just people didn't talk so much about it. For them it was natural that traders made their way all over the place. And then sometimes they mention this, sometimes they don't, um, but it was a very common thing. And then, um, well, I could go very much into medieval literature where you have then plenty of evidence, um, but um, I just skip over that a little bit uh, because there are too many details I would have to go into. But so at least you see some of the names uh, where the poets at least project. That's all I can say. I cannot say that they proved there, but I can say that many poets projected the possibility that their protagonists served far somewhere in the East. So Gahmoret, for example, and that's the only one I will discuss more at length, um, is the second son, father dies, so what does he do? Well, he doesn't inherit anything, so he just leaves. And uh, with some uh, money, of course, and, and uh, weapons, and then he joins the military service of the Sultan of Babylon. And that's fine, and everyone loves him. When he later dies, the Sultan has a fabulous tomb for him in Arabic and Christian, I mean, in Latin. And so they just accept that. A European knight fighting for uh, the Sultan, and that's just fine. And they regard him a lot. We have this a lot of times. Uh, we have very many pan-European texts where um, the protagonists travel all over the place. And I mean, with pan-European, these were extremely popular texts. So I just skipped this a little bit. You can see uh, the popularity of Alexander the Great is a huge myth. You have massive amounts of texts in India and in uh, maybe Western China and so forth, dealing with the same myth as the people in the West. So you have both the Western myth as well as the Eastern myth, just as an indication then uh, very much for the Eastern Ter Mediterranean, the very famous story of Apollonius of Tyre from the second century in Greek to the 16th, 17th centuries uh, in many different languages. And uh, King Tars is the opposite move from, it's an English text, from the East to England. Um, and uh, end here, this text I've worked on a lot myself, which is so interesting, Rudolf von Ems, um, early 13th century, and he is also one of those who writes this Buddha story I mentioned at the beginning, but that's, I'll leave that aside now. But he also wrote this story, The Good Gerhard, which is a story very unusual, the only one I know of in the entire Middle Ages of a merchant. A merchant of Cologne is the protagonist. And uh, he goes on extensive business travel, Nineveh, Damascus, and that's fine, there's no further discussion. There is no need to discuss the global connections. So he just comes back later and uh, 
crosses the Mediterranean, arrives in Morocco, and there he strikes friendship with the local uh, castellan. They have a business deal with some prisoners. There's some Norwegians and English people, and everything works out just fine. That's all I need to say at this point, otherwise I lose myself. Just simply the literary projection of global connections are always there. And when they don't talk much about it, then probably because it was so much accepted as a standard feature. Um, uh, two more examples quickly. Merusine, a uh, very, very popular story. You all know it from Starbucks, maybe. If you drink coffee, you see on their cups the Merusine figure. And this uh, is then uh, a story from, well, this in French and in German, and lots of artworks dealing with her. But um, the uh, Merusine's sons travel all over the Eastern world and establish their own kingdoms. That's, that's the uh, um, one possibility. And then the latest one is Fortunatus, an extremely popular text, first printed in 1509. And um, the son, I mean, it's not son, Fortunatus starts out in Cyprus, makes his way to Flanders, from there to England, from there then he returns, then gets a magical purse. You can see this here in this uh, woodcut, uh, which never becomes empty, which would be very nice, sort of medieval credit card, <laughs> unlimited credit card. Anyway, from there then he traverses all of Europe, uh, north, south, south, north, um, uh, up to, uh, to Egypt and Constantinople. Mary uh, settles in Cyprus and then later goes on a huge uh, tour through Egypt and then all the way to India where he meets the Presta John and then returns home. Just literary imagination. We don't need to go much further. But of course, this was popular because it appealed to the merchant mentality. So printed in Augsburg, of course, one of the major centers. Augsburg, you know, connection between, you could say London, Augsburg, Venice, uh, Constantinople, Beijing. That was sort of the trade route. And of course, those merchants enjoyed texts that projected international travel. You could ask me, is that really globalism? Well, yes, I would say it's a form of globalism because it projects at least the possibilities of networks. And that's what I only can really confirm at this point. We could go also into a lot of pilgrimage accounts. I skip this a little bit uh, and emphasize here Der Niederrheinische Orientbericht. That is a text I would like to translate soon. Uh, it is one of the most interesting ones. It's sort of the German Marco Polo, except the, the author, somewhere Cologne probably, uh, didn't travel. He only lived there, somewhere. I don't know where. Uh, Damascus maybe, maybe Beirut, I don't know. Uh, he doesn't say, but he describes so many facts of marriages going on and local practices and customs and historical events. Uh, he talks about Armenia, Georgia, uh, then uh, Mongolia. He goes up to, in his report up to Kazakhstan, India, of course, there's a lot of learned material, of course, a lot of drawing from other sources, but he obviously lived there for about 12 years and so left this amazing uh, report. Um, it uh, contains also a lot of references to local fauna and flora, so it's even interesting from that point of view. And um, just here, we have fortunately, just very recent, 2019, the uh, German, modern German translation, um, by Helmut Brahl, and then the, the critical edition just appeared about, um, about six months ago. So we have a really valuable source here that deserves much more attention for the near future. Uh, it's in low German, so anyway, just as an illustration, you see the manuscript. Uh, it is one of those tragic cases. We almost would have lost it. About 15 years ago, the Cologne Historical Archive collapsed just simply collapsed, and about 40 to 50 percent of all manuscripts were destroyed, lost to fire and water, and this text was saved. But you can see the Middle Ages are still always at risk. If we had lost it, we could not talk about this. This is a very important source, confirming, at least from one point of view, that globalism was a possibility, at least in the minds of individuals, okay? That's all I can really say. So I just go through this very quickly. Um, I summarized this already. Uh, yeah, I just want to skip this and slowly come to a conclusion. 
So he pays a lot of respect to the Muslim culture, which is very significant. We find this quite a number of times. Travelers, also another uh, Cologne traveler, Arnold von Harf, uh, I have not included him, who traveled all over the, the world, particularly the Muslim world, and pays a lot of respect, gives us a lot of details uh, about Cairo, for example, very detailed, the, pro, the provision of uh, water there, and so forth. So there's a lot, there are a lot of contexts, a lot of texts, um, and surprisingly, little interest in criticizing other religions. So I think that becomes extremely uh, interesting because the degree of curiosity uh, grew considerably at that time. So they report about a strange world, but treated it with more or less equal, or more or less equal terms. So not everyone, of course. There are lots of pilgrimage authors who had a very negative xenophobic attitude, but lots also who described in very respectful terms. One little example might be, uh, one more time, Marjorie Kemp, who had a lot of trouble because she was a mystic, cried a lot, and the other male pilgrims hated her and wanted to get rid of her. And uh, when she wanted to climb and later in the Holy Land, a uh, famous mountain, no one helped her, except for an Arabic man. And she pays great respect to him. Yeah, he was nice to me. He helped me in that situation. So even in the most Christian context, suddenly there could be a reference to tolerant attitude. And tolerance is one of the preconditions for globalism. So, um, OK, I just skip over this a little bit. You can see uh, how much he's talking about. Also, he refers to the Mongols and that they use paper money. You know, uh, very important aspect. Here's a reference to a study on the influx of Buddhism by Romedio Schmitz Esser in this volume. So he has more evidence about that uh, trade between East and West. Um, I uh, skip this. Here are my conclusions. Now, so we have a lot of data. Uh, the uh, map that I tried to project is still very fragmentary. Uh, we know a lot more now about um, medieval awareness or pre-modern awareness about other peoples, their cultures and customs. We have uh, a lot of data concerning military conflicts, which are very interesting because military conflicts always contribute in a certain way, despite all terrible issues, to connections, uh, oftentimes settlements, marriages, and so forth. Um, there are a lot of reports about animals, birds, and plants, so fauna and flora, as found in other parts of the world. Um, and the, the, the anonymous author of the Niederrheinische Orientbericht was obviously very strongly aware uh, of the great interest people might have about, uh, about this information. And it's firsthand. And that is really an eyewitness. And it's much more important. And that's the reason why I compared with Marco Polo. It's uh, very important as a direct eyewitness account. We can trust him to some extent. There's always a certain degree of drawing from sources and a little bit fabulation here and there. But it's much more serious than uh, almost anything else. There's curiosity and respect. Maybe even early toleration. And I call it global perspectives. That is really different. So, uh, OK, I skip all this a little bit. So I could go now into many different aspects, uh, but I think I will extend my uh, the time I have too much, right? Well, yeah, OK. Uh, just referring also to Arabic travelers. Very interesting, Ibn Fadlan and Ibn Battuta. So there are many others. Uh, and. I also would like to refer to an, a Chinese traveler, namely Raban Sauma, of whom I learned only very recently myself, um, who was maybe an Uyghur, so northwestern China today. He traveled to Jerusalem, um, but he stayed then in Baghdad. He was probably an historian and then um, made a second trip to Europe in about the 1280s. And, um, they, some at least of his partners, talked to him in Persian. 
That is the nap as we imagined he took. That is really, if at all, then this is a global traveler. And he is just one, probably, of many others. I myself only scratching the surface um, and look for many, many other uh, comments about all this. Um, but this is more or less the, the Silk Road. And of course, this is funny. The Chinese are trying right now to reconstitute the Silk Road. I mean, it's like the medieval Silk Road is now reinvested in the modern Silk Road. So, okay, just waiting for you. Okay, good. Here are my conclusions. I would like to say that virtually every culture is somehow the result of globalism, meaning that everyone who writes, everyone who is doing business, everyone who is in architecture uh, or music will know of other things, will have traveled. So the whole notion of medieval people being parochial and uh, non-worldly is completely wrong. We know this already since Norbert Ola's famous study, uh, Travel in the Middle Ages, medieval roads were filled with people. Of course the farmers stayed home. Of course they couldn't travel. They cannot travel either today. They're bound to, uh, to their farms. But anyone else was commonly on the road. And I have sort of tried to indicate to what extent then even uh, trade with far away markets was of very common nature. So the situation today is really not that, or I should say the other way around, the Middle Ages were probably not that far away from the situation today. Maybe in terms of quantity, yes, much less than today, but in terms of quality, maybe even much more than we might have thought. And on that note, I just have reached the end of my talk. I would like to express one more time my thanks that I could present this. I find it extremely exciting, and I hope that we can have a little bit of a discussion, because that's really scholarship. That we as scholars become more global and exchange, criticize each other, and help each other promote our understanding. So thank you so much for enduring my long talk, and I appreciate it one more time that I could talk to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for such a rich and inspiring talk, uh, which opens so many avenues for, for discussion and debate. So the floor is open for your questions. And I will gently ask everybody to present themselves uh, so that the audience online can know who is speaking. Okay. So, uh, yeah, uh, thank you for uh, a very interesting, excellent uh, lecture. My name is Miłosz Sosnowski. I work here at the department. And I, 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 have, uh, I have two questions. I wrote them down because my English got a little rusty lately. But so so I, I was at a Mammoth conference uh, this, this month with a plenary talk about a South Asian ship uh, from, uh, 18, uh, from 800s. And this ship was carrying cargo through an Indian Ocean, and mostly this was South Asian stuff, and with, with some barely discernible signs of Arab influence. And for the speaker, this ship proved much. Uh, I kid you not. It, it was like, haha, 9th ninth, ninth century globalization existed. China was already in the, in the industrial age. The Eurocentrism scholarship is bad and things like that. But, but, but is this South Asian ship really global Middle Ages? And uh, this is different than the stuff that you spoke about. Cordoba, Byzantium, Magdeburg. Uh, Hans, or the role of Mali, and especially the, this, this poor elephant, uh, Abul Abbas, who, who was shipped to Liguria and died soon after, after reaching uh, Aachen. But those things are no, not new at all. Uh, and the first question then is, I think, do we need term globalism to, to, to study stuff like that? What, what's the added value? And where and when are the Middle Ages then? Where, where are they? And, and the second question, could, could, well, connected with this one, is, is well, the, the, the globe is round, it's spherical. And the examples that you gave, are of, of, obviously, they are all over the place. But, but, but really not at the same time. Uh, because these are examples of Mediterranean, post-Roman, North Asian, 
Some are very importantly uh, Christian, or particularly Western Christian. And um, Rabban Sauma is not Chinese. He is Christian, Nestorian. Um, so are the pre-Columbian, to say it Eurocentrically, cultures global? What is global? And why is it global? Thank you very much. These are interesting and valuable questions. First of all, I would like to also raise the scepter, um, the specter that... This is the mic. Oh, the mic. forgot. Sorry about that. Thank you very much for these good questions. They are, they are very constructive and helpful. Um, first, we also are aware of Sinocentrism. So when we talk about Eurocentrism, we also have to be very aware that the centrism happens in other parts of the world as well. So the Chinese were very Sinocentric. I think that's an important factor. But trade is one of the key components. And I'm sure I would agree with you that social and economic historians have already for a long time indicated the travel that, or the economic trade that took place. And uh, let's say we ha archaeologists have found many hordes of coins in Russia, for example, coming from somewhere, Spain, and so forth. So that is actually quite uh, well known. Um, but this has not led really to a re-evaluation of the larger connections. Global, I mean, I'm a, just as you, I'm a little bit worried that we throw in too much into this whole uh, uh, issue. Uh, many people who write these books on global history then immediately throw in Mesoamerica, for example, then the Philippines, and I don't see connections, and I don't know what this would entail. So for me, uh, it is much more important to trace concrete elements, concrete contacts. And let me give you an example uh, of a little bit later time, namely the 17th century. Just when the Chinese turned their attention away from Western world, or Arabic world, to focus more on the north and their own borders, a certain vacuum opened up. And that vacuum was suddenly very quickly filled by the Jesuits. And the Jesuits went to China, Matteo Ricci and others, and they tried, of course, to missionize and uh, extend and build a global network, which they achieved, actually, because in the following centuries, they were in the Philippines, Mexico, in my area, and in many other parts of the world. So the Jesuits kind of picked up the baton and used it for their own purposes. But what good does it all do if we um, simply replicate what previous scholars have done and simply put these various parts together? Does it not simply remain a patchwork, as you were kind of asking? And to some extent, I'm just as much as a critic as you are. But at the same time, I think if we pursue further the notion of networking, where does the network actually happen? In other words, I am interested in the nodes. Where are the actual points of contacts? Where did they begin to exchange? When we came down, I just wanted to tell him something about a 17th century, you know, that's not my time, but Adam Olearius, who traveled 1639 or so from Schleswig, first to Moscow, and then on the second trip, he goes all the way to Isfahan. It's a massive travel log, which I have in my own office, printed in 1659, contains several chapters of literature of Persian literature, in Persian, for a German audience. And that is a transformative element. So I think that helps us to get beyond our narrow confines. In other words, what we, the, what we learn or profit from it, I think, is that we take things that are all well known. I mean, virtually, you're, you're right. All these things are well known in many different quarters of research and bring them together, so synergy, so that we move beyond a narrow Eurocentric uh, viewpoint. I have nothing against Eurocentric. I mean, that helps me already. Eurocentric is already so hard to do. There are so many different cultures in Europe, I understand. But it, I would say, um, if we can understand better how the con connections happened, if I can trace maybe more specifically trade between London, Augsburg, Venice, Constantinople, and then further east. 
There's a recent study, which I have not included, uh, talking about silk trade coming from China. And they used certain patterns. Uh, and they went to Black Sea, from there then to Ven no, not Venice, to Lucca. And in Lucca, they were so uh, attracted to this that they started copying the Chinese patterns and started their own silk industry, ultimately shutting out the Chinese trade. So that's where you see suddenly influences, and these influences shaping different uh, cultures. If they just stand next to each other and far apart, then what's the point? That's very nice. We give credit, we pay credit or respect to the various cultures. You know, I pay great respect maybe to the Brazilian cultures. That's fine. I, I would say certainly we have medievalists need also to consider Morocco or whatever it might be or Senegal, but it has nothing to do with my subject matter. So I pay respect, yeah, do respect to them, but it doesn't do much. I need connections. And that's what I find is then productive, when we can suddenly see how exchanges took place. Hence, uh, what I referred to quickly to the Huns, Mongols, Saracens, well, Saracens, I mean, Arabs, sorry. Um, sorry, different story, but let's say the Mongols, they came and left. What did they achieve? Not much. I mean, they didn't leave much of influence. And so they're not really the most helpful players. The Vikings, a different story. They transported a lot of stuff back and forth. So maybe that might help. Would that be good? Okay. Ich werde lieber Deutsch sprechen, nicht nur zuletzt, zuletzt deswegen, das ist Muttersprache von Professor Klassen. Aber es ist auch deswegen, dass für mich bequemer ist. Ja. Äh, zunächst mal eine Sachkorrektur, ich glaube. Also ich denke nicht, dass die Hunen äh, äh, eine Art World Player waren. Heutzutage äh, die äh, yeah. weltgeschichtliche yeah. Rolle der Hunen ist schon längst beschränkt, mhm. längst beschränkt. Ja. Der Hunensturm hat nicht die gleiche Bedeutung wie zum Beispiel die Ausbreitung von Araber und so weiter. Ja. Mhm. Ganz, ganz genau sagen, das war eine regionale Macht und nur seit Alleinherrschaft von Attila bis zu seinem Ende neun Jahren ja. in Mitteleuropa. Ja. Mhm. Natürlich, es gibt die Forscher, die mhm. seit langem linken die äh, Xiongnu mit Hunen, aber das ist auch unbeweisbar. Mhm. Also es ist besser, mhm. auf diese Beispiel, ich glaube, zu verzichten. Aber die sind natürlich Urheber <lacht> seiner Gedanken. <lacht> Zweitens, äh, die Erscheinung sogenannten Wikinger, oder Wareger, äh, äh, oder lieber, oder besser, genauer gesagt, Weringer in genau. Osteuropa. Es ist nicht mehr im 9. Jahrhundert, sondern sicher im 7. Im 7. Jahrhundert Siebten oder vielleicht am Ende des 6. Jahrhunderts. Also sicher im 7. Jahrhundert. Ja. Mhm. Im Jahrhundert. Die waren... <lacht> eine besondere Art Aha. Wanderer, sozusagen, so Krieger, Kaufmanns, aber vor allem Banditen ja. und Plünderer. Ja. Und mhm. die Russland von heute hat sehr viel von Russen, skandinavischen Russen, geerbt. Ja. Nicht nur in dieser ja. Hinsicht. Ja. Ja. Aber eine, eine Frage, nämlich... Die globalistisch denkenden Forscher überall finden die gleichen Phänomene. Also im Mittelalter, im Altertum, also ich habe die also Mehrheit von, von, von ähm, die Merkmale und Züge, die, sind, die sie für Mittelalter gefunden haben, ich finde, das passt alles, auch für Altertum, ganz mhm. sicher. Also, äh, die globalistisch denkenden Forscher überall finden die gleichen Phänomene. Ja. Aber es gibt krasse Differenzen. Ja. 
zwischen diesen Epochen. Mhm. Und man muss mehr Gewicht auf die Differenzen äh, zu legen, als äh, auch äh, als mhm. auf äh, äh, Ähnlichkeiten. Äh, Ihr globale Mittelalter ist ohne beiden Amerikaner, Australien, fast ohne Afrika. Ja. Mhm. Ich glaube, die haben sehr gut die ja. kulturelle, politische, religiöse Vernetzung skizziert. Aber das ist, ob das wirklich global ist, 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 ja, ja. ist mir nicht ganz klar. Ich gehe davon aus, dass man darf, nur die wirklich Vergleichbare zu vergleichen. Vielleicht, das ist ganz veraltete äh, methodologische <lacht> Voraussetzung. Nein, nein, nein. <lacht> Aber ja. immer ist mit mir. Ja. Also, ja. Äh, wenn Sie auf die Differenzen äh, kurz eingehen mhm. könnten, werde ich auch ja. sehr dankbar. Dankeschön. Dankeschön. Jetzt weiß ich nicht, auf welcher Sprache. Talvez in Franz Espanol, ja? Okay. So, the, the question was uh, first, to what extent we could use the history of the Huns? And that's, of course, the same history of the Vikings or the Mongols. To what extent did these forces really exert a major influence? Um, all we can really say, I suppose, is that we have here examples of massive migration. And I think that was the focus. So uh, wherever they came from, but you do, and that's the answer to the second question, uh, don't we already have that in late antiquity? And of course we do have that. And the latest research in terms of late, middle, uh, late antiquity uh, really indicates that there was not a massive assault of Germanic people, but rather a slow and long-term process of well, migration, integration, and replacement of Roman general soldiers and so forth with Germanic uh, people. So to what extent the Huns really left an influence, that is hard to say, I don't know. But they roamed a lot. That is sort of all I could really say. We could also then quickly refer to the Avars, for example, also nomadic people. I could refer to the Majars, another nomadic people. So these are just names that I dropped uh, to indicate how much Europe was in m movement. More I cannot really say. I do not know to what extent the Mongols or the Huns really left an influence. Even with the Vikings, and the term is a little bit problematic, let's say the Icelanders. Uh, yeah, pillaging, sure, that does not mean really globalism, but the fact that they could travel around so much, that they had the global awareness where to go, how to go, how to find the way across all of Russia, the Volga, down to the Black Sea, across the Mediterranean, settling in southern Italy, settling then in Normandy. These are Norse men. That is, I think, a very important aspect. It allows me, however, to switch over to another people, another part of the world, just in analogy. How did the Polynesians find Hawaii? These are the loneliest islands of the world, 2,000 sea miles away from any other island. And these people made it just with the stars and uh, flow of the currents, maybe birds, whatever. And they made it and created a whole settlement of the Hawaiian cultures. That's already the same time period. So we do, that is the point, I think. We've, um, we understand, I think, history better if we understand it a history in motion, in, in Bewegung. There's a very recent book that just came out, uh, Dominic, um, that's his last name, Geschichte in Bewegung. And I like that word quite a lot. I think we understand history much better if we see it's a constantly shifting of populations, also social shifts, economic shifts, uh, repressions here in the uh, violence. So I think that is, uh, gives us a better sense of the instability of history. 
And I think that's where then the notion of globalism helps us a little bit. That uh, we cannot, that I didn't talk really about Mesoamerica, absolutely. However, let me emphasize, since I live in Arizona, we have a lot of medieval culture, even my own culture. The um, Sinaguas left my area about 1400. The name tells you everything, Sinaguas, no water. We have lots of medieval ruins in Arizona. Uh, Wupatki, Tuzigut, uh, Mesa Verde, that's in Colorado. We have uh, uh, um, Montezuma's Castle and so forth, and Walnut Canyon. So lots of medieval ruins in America, in Arizona. I always surprise my students by saying, hey, Middle Ages, ah, look around you. It's all medieval here. We are very ancient cultures, really. Indeed, they have nothing, nothing to do with Europe. Uh, I mean, at some point, I have to admit, as arrogant as I might be, but I have my own limits, and rightly so. There are no connections. If at all, then you can say starting the 16th century. But before, it doesn't make sense. But lots of scholars like to do this. They publish them these very popular books, very thick, very expensive, global history. And suddenly they ask Mesoamerica, the Philippines, uh, whatever, uh, Somalia, whatever, the Ethiopian kingdom, it all suddenly fits together. That doesn't work for me. I'm looking for networks, for actual contacts. And maps are a wonderful way, as you do, narratives that describe other parts of the world. That helps me to understand a little bit intellectual mobility mental mobility. And if that works, it makes sense. If it doesn't work, then let's leave it aside. We pay due respect to the Mesoamericans, fine, but the Mayans have nothing to do with the Europeans, sorry. Close the door. Otherwise, I open the, the door for everything, and that means nothing at the end. It might be also the, re, the result of American situation. You know, here in Europe, you have your European history, and that's all fine. In America, for historians, it's always a difficult and tricky situation. What should they teach? Asian history or Western European history? So I remember my son in high school had to take world history and said, that's fine, I can help you with that. So he came home with me and said, well, what do you know about the Philippines in the 16th century? Nothing. You know, I was suddenly stunned as a, you know, and he had to cover everything and nothing. That's then the problem. If you go out and you cover everything, then it's, it's a hodgepodge of meaningless entities. But you know, just to come back to two examples, to trace, for example, the transmission and translation of the story of Balaam and Yosafat from language to language, that is evidence. The sale of Gerfhawkins from Iceland to uh, Mamluk, Egypt, that is evidence. That I find useful. And that's the reason why, for me, in the middle, the Niederrheinische Orientbericht is great. That helps. Is that OK? Yeah, very good. Thank you. Very quick question with very short answer. Well, oh, I'm I, sorry. I need yeah, to I'm make a very, very much. hard choice between the Professor Olinski and my student. Uh. <laughs> Ich danke Ihnen für Ihren so interessanten und äh, inspirierenden Vortrag äh, und möchte ich kurze äh, Begrifflichkeit, Bemerkung machen. Also Globalisation als Begriff möchte ich gerne benutzen, und, um bestimmte Weltgeschichte Probleme zu klären. Aber wie weit steht diese Begrifflichkeit vom äh, alten Begriffen, wie zum Beispiel Eukumene mhm. oder Orbis Romanus? Mhm. Und, äh, oder Sphäre Mundus oder ganz am Ende Globus selbst. Es, es geht in Remer nur um die geografische Vorstellung, mhm. Vorstellungen oder auch um die kulturell geografische. Mhm. Also wenn wir diese äh, Eukumene als ein Kreis, als eine äh, Art von Verbindung äh, von Völkern betrachten, gibt es natürlich ein Prinzip, das ist die Sprache. Mhm. Wenn wir Orbis Romanus 
äh, sehen, dann, dann sehen wir die bestimmten Rechte, die Vorstellungen von Recht, von Staat selbst, Angehörigkeit zu dieser Stadt und so weiter. Mhm. Also ich frage mich selbst und möchte auch diese Frage vorstellen, vielleicht diesen allgemein herrschenden jetzt in der Wissenschaft, äh, nicht nur in der Geschichte, in Sozialwissenschaften, Begriff äh, Globalisation, bringt die bestimmte Schwierigkeiten oder vielleicht auch ein Risiko, ja. dass wenn wir diese alten Quellen lesen, dann äh, gehen wir ein bisschen in diese weit modernisierende Vorstellungen. Wer mit wem in Verbindung bleibt, äh, das ist okay, das ist ja. schon eine Globalisation. Ich meine, das stimmt nicht. Es, es, es ging damals um die bestimmten Werte wie die Sprache, mhm. Gottvorstellungen, äh, Staatsvorstellungen und so weiter. Stimmt das? Was meinen Sie? Also, vielen Dank dafür. Uh, sorry, thank you very much. Um, one ironic aspect, of course, is in all historical studies, we always tend to reinvent the wheel. I mean, you know, this is, sorry, but that's reality. Every generation tries to find its own niche and they kind of rehash, redo what we already have known lots of years ago. And frankly, if you go through a lot of historical studies from the 19th century, it's sometimes embarrassing how much they knew and how little we know today. You know, <laughs> that's granted all that. Um, but nevertheless, I think the term globalism uh, is an interesting challenge. And we are, of course, we face questions all the time, but more, let's say, from the modernist, uh, modern scholars uh, than from scholars in antiquity, which is uh, very understandable because the medievalists are revolting against the claim by modernists that nothing happened prior to, let's say, 1980 or so. And um, this has simply forced us to think a little bit more broadly. Maybe we have to simply return to understandings from ancient times. But you brought up a very beautiful point, uh, which would be really valuable. I'm not only an expert, uh, but you mentioned the Roman Empire, and indeed that was a global empire. They certainly uh, had trade connections with the Parthians and further Black Sea. Uh, I don't know how far, I mean, that's not my expertise, but they certainly tried everything they could to go as far east as possible, and also probably down Africa to some extent. I don't quite know how much. But um, that was certainly a, an a aspect we should keep in mind. Um, but I think it is valuable to, to think about the challenges. We don't have to agree with everything. I mean, I, I think I've expressed it clearly enough how much I'm questioning a lot of these recent studies. Uh, but I think it's also dangerous to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Just because it's a modern term uh, we, doesn't mean that we cannot discover new things. We are becoming more sensitive, maybe, to things we have known already for a long time. And maybe, I mean, what is in history? In history, we, just sort of, we are players. We play with the same balls, it's the same things, and we're looking simply for new configurations. So I suggest that using the term globalism allows us nicely to see things maybe in a broader context and to be more open to connections we haven't quite thought. I mean, I personally, I was shocked when I read this study about the Gare Falcons. That is such a beautiful evidence. And um, trade, is, I'm not an economic historian, but it's a very important uh, uh, component. By the same token, I suggest that historians consider more the literary materials that I'm better familiar with uh, as indications of the mentality, the ideas, the concepts. Um, so there, I think you can reach maybe, oh, not completely old, but new, a uh, combination of new ideas. And I think that the discussion is very productive. We have a lot of attempts, a lot of different schools of thinking. So we are right in the midst of a change possible. And I find that exciting. That's, I think, that we can agree. You're an archaeologist, right? Yeah, Moment. We have uns nämlich schon vor 2008 getroffen. 
Und da sind sie damals nach Athen gereist. Und sie sagten uns damals, das habe ich immer wieder zitiert, sie treffen in Athen nur deutsch sprechende Kollegen. Ja, ja. Denn die Engländer die können kein Deutsch. Master in Classical Culture. Da, so. Daran erinnere oh. ich mich sehr gut, ja. Klasse. Sorry, it was a little anecdote. I am terribly sorry and apologize with uh, all those who have more curiosities, but uh, there are some of us who need to follow or deliver classes in five minutes. Uh, so I am sure that if you write to Professor Klassen, he will, he will kind of answer you and he will be also available for five minutes after lecture. So, so I invite those uh, to use those two channels to address questions. Uh, well, thank you once again uh, to Professor Klassen, to all these cuttons, and please join me in the final applause to our speaker. Thank you. Dziękuję bardzo.